Mr. Gilstrap literally set up half the show today. I'm going to give him <laughs> credits as show producer as well here. Yeah, we're going to uh, double his pay. That's true. That's true. <laughs> throw Let's another, talk about that. Throw another zero at the <laughs> yeah, end. Of that's that right. Show. That's right. Triple it, in fact. Yeah. Would you like to set up our next guest, Mr. Gilstrap? I, I would like to. Uh, the uh, our, our guest is Susan Antkeny. Uh, she's the author of American Fly Girl. And by way of, of introduction, I should say, we... Um, we share a publisher, uh, Kensington Publishing, and a publicist in Pryor. I, I will not lie. I have received a copy of the book. They often come with far too little advance notice to actually read them. But Anne uh, Pryor, the publicist, has never led me astray. Uh, she's sent us a, a lot of really fine authors. And Susan, welcome to the program. Can't wait to talk about this book. The, uh, I've, I've read the notes on it. It seems fascinating. Welcome to the program. Thank you, John. Good morning, and thank you for having me. And the book is called American Fly Girl. Yes. Tell us about this book. Well, uh, American Fly Girl is Hazel Ying Lee. She was a pilot in World War II. Um, Hazel was born in Portland, right here in Portland, Oregon's Chinatown in 1912, where she lived with her parents, who were Chinese immigrants. Um, she was born during the Chinese Exclusion Act, so there were all kinds of discriminations placed against her, and at that time, Chinese were um, meant to keep into their Chinatown. So the odds were against her right from the start. When she was 19, she was offered a ride in a biplane and on the spot, fell in love with it, decided she wanted to become a pilot. But she had to find a job to pay for lessons and find an instructor who would teach a woman and a Chinese woman to fly. Um, women were considered too temperamental to handle flying at that time. They, they weren't even encouraged to get inside planes. It was thought that they would go berserk if they were in an airplane. So it was a very different time. Basil found an instructor named Al Greenwood who was training a group of young American boy, boys, really, here to go to China where pilots were needed to fight the invading Japanese. At that time, China had small fledgling air forces scattered across the country, and the invading Japanese found little resistance. China needed aircraft and pilots, so they sent delegate scouts to Chinatowns in the United States looking for young men willing to train for combat. The Excuse Chinese me, was this during the, the Claire Chenault American Volunteer Group time? Yes. Okay. Yes. It, this is 1931 to 33 the volunteers started going to China in 33. And I think about 200 total young men and Hazel went from the United States. How unusual was it to have a female pilot at this time? Well, extremely unusual. And, um, you know, she was the first Asian American woman to earn a pilot's license in the United States. Um, there were very few Asian American women flying. And at that time, um, well, by 1930, I think there were about 200 women pilots, and that was about to skyrocket, but it, it just wasn't acceptable. So, so it, was, it was very unusual. What, what was their main job that were they, uh, I assume, I presume they weren't permitted to do combat missions, were they? You mean Hazel when she was in China? The pilots, you, yes. could they do combat missions? Oh, that was their purpose, yes. I the see. Americans okay. that were sent over there were very successfully, they were excellent pilots. It was said that they were the best China had, and they were fighting dogfights against the Japanese, and there were quite a few who lost their lives in those battles. Hazel was not allowed to fly because she was a woman, much to her disappointment, but all of them were uh, commissioned as officers in the Chinese Air Force. Am I am I alone in this? But I I've not heard any stories of female <laughs> combat pilots in any. There's none in my history books that I remember growing up in school reading, and I have not been aware of any, and even on the History Channel shows that I've watched. Right, and at that time in the early 30s, remember this is you know well before World War II. She may have been she and her friend Virginia actually both went to China as combat pilots, and she very well may have been the first only combat pilot but she didn't get to fly combat and that was very frustrating for her you know i find this very fascinating that that mm -hmm. in that time um here's a woman who had to 
uh, overcome a lot of discrimination here in the states just because she was uh, Chinese, uh, a Chinese immigrant, or Ch or actually she was uh, American born to Chinese immigrants, correct? Yes. So she had to overcome that discrimination here in the United States. And then when she goes over to China, <laughs> it's the, the gender discrimination that she would have had to have uh, faced at that time over there. So she, she had to overcome a lot of obstacles. Yes. And, and in China, when they all arrived, these young people from Portland, the Chinese were a little suspicious of them because they were American also. They really weren't sure that they weren't spying, and so they had to go through a lot of training before they were put into combat. But so, you know, here she was considered Chinese. There she was considered American. Um, she was never really in. So what is, I, I'm not familiar with the Chinese uh, Exclusion Act. So w what was that? Uh, that was established in 1882. And it was the first act to limit people from another country coming into our country, and it was intended to limit uh, Chinese coming over as laborers. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for it. Part of it was political, but it went on until 1943, when, of course, China was an ally of ours in World War II. And it basically kept the Chinese powerless. It, it kept them in their, in their Chinatowns. Um, the only Chinese that were allowed to immigrate at that time were... Um, Merchants, I believe Hazel's father, that's how he got into the country. But any kind of laborers were not permitted. And, of course, Chinese at that time couldn't own a home. They couldn't own land. They couldn't vote. They couldn't sit on a jury. They had to carry identification. They had no rights and weren't allowed in many public places like restaurants. So how does Hazel's story work out ultimately in this particular situation, Susan? Well, she does go to China for um, quite a few years. She's over in China, and she's a lieutenant there. She comes back to the United States after um, she's in Canton when China is bombed, and she actually becomes a war refugee. She barely escapes Canton and gets back to the United States. World War II is, is just about to happen. It's happening over in Europe, and she's thinking there will be an opportunity for her to fly for the United States military. And she continues to write and ask them, and they turn her down until um, she learns about the WASP program being set up for women pilots to replace men who are ferrying aircraft in the United States to release them for combat overseas. So these women were trained to do the work of the men in the United States, and they were trained to fly 78 different types of aircraft, including uh, a, a few, like Hazel flew fighter aircraft. Was she uh, flying them in, in on combat missions, or was she uh, ferrying them from one place to another? No, much to her disappointment, she was never allowed to fly in combat. She flew them in this country uh, off the factory assembly line to bombardier schools or um, flight schools and embarkment to go overseas. Um she was training pilots. I mean, it was very dangerous. A lot of the planes uh, she was a test pilot for because they had just come off and they might be marked okay, but they weren't okay. Mm -hmm. And she'd be flying a different plane every day instead of one that she was really familiar with. So, you know, they had grueling training and it was still extremely dangerous and many wasps lost their lives. I read in Louis Zamperini's book, I think he flew in, was it B-25s, uh, maybe? I'm trying to remember this. B-24. B-24, yes. thank you. More pilots and crew members in World War II were killed in training missions than were actually shot down and killed? Wow. That is correct, yes. And, mm -hmm. and that speaks to the danger of, of moving these aircraft and, and, and learning to fly them. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, the WASP, you know, some of them died early on in their training when they were just trying to learn to fly all the different planes. Um, yes, it was it was dangerous. We think we think about pilots in battle, and of course that's dangerous. You're being fired at. Although wasps were being fired at too from the ground when they were towing targets, but it's just dangerous to learn to fly. And those fighter aircraft went over 400 miles an hour. So ultimately, what happens after World War II with Hazel? She doesn't survive after World War II. She um, is killed in an accident before the war ends. 
Oh. What happened in the accident? In, in um, it, accident? it was in Montana on Thanksgiving Day, and um, because it was Thanksgiving and the weather had been bad across the country, the planes that were coming from Niagara factories, um, it took them a week or more to get across the country. So as it happened, the weather broke, and they all descended on um, the Air Force Base in East Montana at the same time. And because it was a holiday, the tower was understaffed, and um, the pilots were getting garbled messages about landing. Anyway, the other pilot that crashed into Hazel didn't have a working radio, and he came in slightly different angle right on top of her. She didn't see him. He didn't see her. And he landed on top of her, and their planes exploded. Mm. She um, was burned actually on fire when she was taken out of her airplane, and she lived for about three days. Ah. Wow. So what attracted you to this story? How did you find the story and develop it? Well, Hazel is a local girl from Portland, so I knew about Hazel. And um, a publisher was interested in, um, our publisher was interested in a book about her, because one hadn't been written, and she thought, this is just a fascinating character. She already had the title, American Fly Girl. And um, she asked me about it. She said, do you think there's enough to write a book? And um, I started looking on the Internet, and I just, I mean, right from that first picture I saw, which is the the book cover, I was so drawn in by her. Um, You can just see the attitude and the joy on her face in, in what she's doing. And all of the obstacles, the limitations that were put on her, and she just kept, you know, going through it all. No meant nothing to her. She just kept kept relentless determination. And I was really inspired by that. I, I really just fell in love with her immediately and was honored to be asked to write the book. So did the research take you to interesting places that you hadn't uh, been before, either intellectually or physically? Yes. I mean, to be honest, I didn't really know much about China, and it was fascinating to me. I, I knew nothing about the young men that were trained here in Hazel to go over there and help them. I just thought that was incredibly courageous and um, unusual. So I didn't know much about that time, and, and I found that really interesting. But also, Hazel lived in Portland, where I have lived all my life, and so there was a lot that was very familiar to me, and I love that. How does uh, a female pilot, Chinese American female pilot, get inspired to become a pilot. I'm thinking back a hundred years ago. You know, most of us are inspired by a role model who looks like us. You know, an adult version of us. There couldn't have been adult female Chinese pilots or female pilots. Period. That she could have been modeling herself after at this time. Can you tell me her inspiration here? No, there weren't. Um, I'm sure she didn't know of another Chinese or Asian American woman pilot. There, there were a few in Portland eventually, but, you know, close to her time, but not when she was determined to get her own license. And um, I really think from that first flight, you know, she was 19. She was discontent working in her father's restaurant and she was looking for something. And she just fell in love with the sensation, the power, the the fact that in the sky nobody could see she was Chinese or woman or anything. It was it was very empowering and probably more so for an Asian American woman of that time. So I just think there was nothing that was going to stop her from flying and and serving her country. That was always her determination to serve. Even you know when she was in China, she wanted to be serving this country and wanted to get back and um, fight for America. Well, Amelia Earhart was probably in the news about that time, right? I, I oh, think. yes. And she was a huge fan. Hazel was a huge fan of Amelia Earhart. Yes, she was an inspiration. That makes sense. Hmm. So are there surviving family members that tell her story to this day? There are a few. Hazel, of course, didn't have children. Uh, she ha- There are some nieces and nephews. Her sister's carried on her legacy. They are no longer here. I spoke to a niece, and interestingly, the surviving family members really don't know anything about Hazel. After Hazel and her brother both died within a few days of each other, he died over in France, um, they didn't talk about it. It was just sort of put away, like maybe it was too sad to talk about. And they 
really have no information other than the fact that she died. And, of course, she's buried here. Was her brother killed in World War II operations in France? Yes, yes, um, he was in a, in a battle. Oh, my goodness. Uh, in, in the end here, your conclusion on this story, Susan, what message would you like people to take from this? Um, you know, I, I'm struck by the idea that people of any gender or ethnicity can contribute to the protection and betterment of our country. And that, that was all Hazel really wanted to do. And, and, and the fact that she persisted using a peaceful, relentless determination, I, I just found that incredible. She was all in. And if someone told her no, she challenged the reason. So her courage, the matter of fact way she stood up and stood, stood her ground really inspired me. I hope it will inspire readers as well. Well, I want you to know one of our Facebook listeners just uh, put up that they have pre-ordered your book. So, you know, this is at least worth the, the half hour you spent with us. So, <laughs> Oh, thank you very much. Well, it's fun talking with you, John. It's definitely worth the time. <laughs> what, what is your next project, Susan? I'm not sure. Um, I'm toying with the idea of writing about Arthur Chin, who was a uh, is considered the first World War II flying ace, and he was in that class of flying school students here in Portland that, that went to China, so he is mentioned in American Fly Girl, and his story is fascinating. So um, we're, we're kind of playing with that right now. All right, very good. Have you had breakfast yet in Portland? <laughs> I haven't. I'm drinking my tea. <laughs> 7 a.m. there just about, so we appreciate you waking up early to do this interview. Yes. Where, oh, I was happy to do it. Where can we find your book, Susan? Uh, my website is SusanTateAnkeny.com, and it's at most bookstores, but you will find links on my website. And as you know, I'm on Facebook and Instagram. And the official pub date is not till April 23rd, so if it's not there yet, yes. be patient. Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday. <laughs> yes. Susan, thank you so much. We appreciate you waking up early and making the cross-country phone call. Oh, thank you very much. Have a great day. Take care. Best Thank of you. luck with the book, American Fly Girl at 955.